I guess in many respects, um, maybe maybe Atif, if you can comment, uh, what what are we seeing on a BYOD device? Why why do you feel they're not protected today? And, and again, we'll obviously talk about some other stuff, but why do you feel it's really not protected today? Well, I mean, if I mean in in this slide, I mean we have mentioned quite a bit of infection vector. I mean these are the main vector. You have corporate. You have personal email, you have mobile web and social network. And if you see all this thing, I mean, even out of this five, uh, your corporate email is where you have protection enabled, right? Uh, if you see your personal email, mobile web and social network, I mean, uh, pretty much there's no protection against advanced phishing attacks uh, when it comes to these communication media. And even within corporate email, on average, we are seeing a miss rate of approximately 10 to 12% uh, I mean, and, and most of the customer that we have, they have pretty cutting edge email gateway available, right? Barracudas of the world, Minecraft of the world, right? Uh, but still, uh, you know, what the, the attacks are going through and the reason is that no technology is perfect, right? So uh, this is where you see, okay, there's a 10% gap in your corporate email and then there's a 100% gap when it comes to the mobile web and social network, right? So if that's the case, I mean, then you, you're just, you're simply not protected. I mean, if you combine all these communication medium. And the worst thing is that people have a very good understanding of how email phishing work, at least administrators, they have a very good. So whenever there's an incident, they can go back into the email logs and see what really went wrong. And that's the reason that a lot of time you see, okay, the email phishing was a reason. But let me tell you that when it comes to other communication medium, it's all in the air. Your employee saw something on the web, clicked on that, got compromised. It's not getting logged anywhere. It's TLS 1.3 or TLS 1.2, your web logs simply log a domain name. So now it's extremely difficult to detect that. I mean, even your employees got compromised, which is a lot more easier email. So that's the reason that you get a lot more attention on email phishing because you can see it eventually, right? Okay, this thing went wrong. But when it comes to the other thing, these attacks do not leave any trace. And this is where it gives you a false sense of security that, okay, corporate email is there. There's a little bit of the gap, 10%, but I'm protecting against the rest. But you're simply not seeing those attacks. I mean, uh, and I'll show you some stats later on the slide where I'm going to take some case studies from our existing customers. And you it will be eye-opening stats, how many phishing links are coming from known email. And nobody was had a visibility or no admin had a visibility in those attacks. And most of the admin come to us within 30 days and say it was it is an eye-opening experience. We thought that, okay, phishing is all about email. And that was the main reason we, we purchased your solution. But once this solution got deployed, I mean, it's coming from everywhere, right? So again, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so really the, the point here, particularly is, uh, everyone shifted to remote working, that BYOD, while it has tremendous benefits from a productivity gain, it's very unprotected. Uh, when you factor in not just, yes, corporate email has some protection to it, but all the other apps that you're access, accessing, you're doing that on that personal device and you're mixing the Twitter use, you're mixing the Facebook use, you're, miss, you're missing, or sorry, you're mixing the LinkedIn use, um, not to mention Instagram and all the other pieces. And those are where it's very unprotected, right? They effectively backdoor crossover into the corporate world. Um, so that that's really at the heart of what you're getting to, correct? That's right. Perfect. So again, what, what I thought I would do is just uh, spend a few moments uh, recapping what's going on from a BYOD perspective, because uh, as with anything, there's varying degrees of implementation of bring your own device uh, in, in the corporation or, or government uh, organizations. You know, obviously on the, for the far left-hand side is truly a bring your own device, whether it be your mobile phone uh, or typically more of your laptop to access corporate resources, but you're also obviously accessing other personal resources uh, today. Um, if it goes from that left-hand side cont continuum all the way over to the right side, which is really company owned and company issued. Now, each one of these deployment aspects or usage aspects uh, really has both a, uh, a strong security approach that can be enabled um, but as we also note here, it can also dramatically affect your privacy. 
Yeah, right. So the further to the right you go from a company owned, you typically can get much more locked down in security policies up to the point where you could say, hey, restrict access to these particular applications um, and restrict access to these particular type of resources. Uh, obviously, you cannot do that in a BYOD environment. Otherwise, you're, <laughs> you're somewhat eliminating the purpose for using that device within your corporation. Um, the, only, the only other thing I, I would point out here, obviously, the further to the right, you do see a significant uh, degradation in privacy. So the real question here is, can you have both? Can you have both a secure environment with BYOD and maintain privacy? Right. So that's, uh, I guess, one of the why we call this is really a, a quote conundrum. Um, and, and so maybe, Atif, maybe you can uh, you talk about this. Can you have both? Can you actually have a highly secure, protected environment from human hacking and phishing while still maintaining privacy? Absolutely. So again, I mean, I mean, in the previous slide, we are trying to make a case that, okay, the corporate email is not the only way attacks are coming and it, these are coming from all over the place, right? So while your corporate email or the SEG solution, all the emails are getting routed through your SEG, okay, you, and you can have protection at the cloud level, right? But when it comes to the other communication medium, how are you gonna protect those, right? One option is that you use your SEG uh, so uh, your web solution, web security solution. The problem is that most of these web solution, they work at the domain level. And the, most of the phishing links are coming through Dropbox of, of the world. And those are end-to-end -end encrypted with TLS 1.2. So your secure web gate, gateways, I mean, simply have no visibility uh, into the HTTPS. And what is the result of that? You're clicking on these links and your uh, web gateways have no clue what's really going on. And at the same time, your email gateways are just for protecting the corporate email gateways, right? They're not, they have no visibility on your other communication medium, LinkedIn, web and all that, right? So then what's the solution? I think the solution is that you, I think if you really want to solve this problem, you have to implement it at the endpoint level, uh, just like an antivirus solution, right? Uh, you know what, I mean, you have to build it at the endpoint level because this is where you get the full visibility. And un unless you have a full visibility, no security solution can work. And at the same time, if you're endpoint, uh, the TLS or any other end-to-end -end encryption is not a problem because you have much greater uh, visibility. At the same time, you're seeing everything across the operating system. So if you're communicating with LinkedIn and all that, you know what, you're protected. But there's a catch. Can you build your endpoint by keeping the privacy? So this is where I think it depends on how vendors are approaching this problem. Like for example, in case of Slash Next, we have a system-wide visibility into what user is doing, but not even a single byte leaves from that device. Everything that we do is happening on that device itself. So you have an endpoint very fast, looking into everything, but not sending any traffic uh, to the outside world, no proxy, nothing actually goes through the device to our cloud, right? So this is where I would say that an approach at the endpoint level that can guarantee that they can do the local analysis on the device despite limited resources available uh, on the device. I think is, this is the way to go. I mean, there's no other way you can offer this type of protection. So maybe to, to recap here or reiterate, um, number one, you want to protect at the endpoint because you, in many respects, I know you said this, you can't, you can't detect and block what you can't see. So with end-to-end -end encryption across multiple apps now, uh, particularly not just again on the corporate side, but the personal side, we, you mentioned WhatsApp, unless you're actually in that browser, in the clear text, you're not going to be able to be detect it and block it. Fair? That's, 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 that's right. Point. I mean, that's right. You can't uh -huh. do it at network level anymore. Right. Um, and the other things that we have seen, like people have tried to solve this through web proxies or browser isolation or uh, even split tunneling, right? Or use some type of corporate VP, uh, VPN. The challenge on that, again, is you don't see a lot of the traffic for those, quote, social apps. Um, you don't see it for certainly crossover attacks that could attack you on the personal front, come back into the corporate front. The personal email come into the corporate email. The other thing you would not see, which is completely unprotected altogether, 
together is mobile, right? Unless you're actually there, you wouldn't be able to detect and block. Um, you would also not be able to detect and block just pure natural language, what we would call BEC type of SMS attacks. Is, is that is that fair? That's right. And again, I mean, the problem lies both in the communication medium and the link itself, right? So if you have a proxy and the link is a Dropbox or the box.com, right, or SharePoint, even your proxy doesn't have access to the content of that page unless you're doing the man in the middle, which is actually almost becoming impossible with TLS 1.3. So on one hand, you don't even have the visibility within the communication medium. Even if I user click on a link, uh, hosted on a cloud service, then your proxy doesn't even have access to that phishing page itself, right? So you are dealing with end-to-end -end encryption, both at the communication medium level and at the same time at the phishing link level. So this is where the endpoint comes in. I mean, endpoint has visibility into both communication medium at the same time, what's really inside a phishing link. So maybe maybe we could drill down a little bit. Like what what does it mean to be able to guarantee privacy? So this means that nothing, like as example, the browser behavior. That if you're using your own personal device, the last thing I would want as a corporation is to see my browser behavior. So in this context, you're saying that since everything happens local and nothing is shared back to corporate other than the infection, that the actual link that that was clicked on. Um, is, is that really what you're getting to? Is that what you mean by being able to guarantee privacy? Absolutely. And I think this is this is where I think I believe that, I mean, unless you have this thing implemented, people would be really, really reluctant to use this endpoint. Nobody likes, uh, no employer likes that, okay, they have something uh, installed on their system that is reporting their behavior information, their site browsing to user. And this is where a lot of people, they don't like proxies on BYOD devices. They think that, okay, I mean, I'm off outside the office and I, I want to use something. And now what happens? I'm a Z scale of the world is looking into what I'm doing, right? So they hate the fact, and then they try to circumvent it. I mean, we have a lot of people who turn off uh, proxy settings uh, on BYOD devices. Com company force them to use proxies. And then whenever they start doing uh, browsing or personal use, they simply turn it off, right? With this particular approach, if you can guarantee privacy and that new, then you get that confidence from the employees that, okay, you can keep on using your device and this thing is gonna protect you by analyzing your activity on the local devices and whatever we are doing is gonna be within this device and will never leave it or will never even touch the cloud. Got it. And maybe maybe one final point to, to make here, because uh, I think there's also been a practice out there to protect BYOD through Microsoft Endpoint Manager, right? The subset or part of Intune. And that's at, at time of, of authentication into your corporate assets, you kind of get your bubble of what you can access. The challenges I, I've heard you say is that that still does not protect whatsoever against all these other communication channels that you have on that local device. And as an example, if you're using the same username and password and they do an account takeover on LinkedIn, that could have a crossover effect into the corporate email side or into these corporate assets because it's very, very common that you use the same credentials on the one side as the other. Um, and or you potentially could download some rogue software in your browser um, and the personal front, and that still can have the spillover effect into the corporate front. Is, is that is that is that accurate? Yeah, again, I mean, you spoke about Intune of the world. Remember, I mean, Intune of the world is about policy control and to some extent uh, stopping malware, right, on Android devices, right? It's not really there for phishing. Remember, I mean, phishing is a web page or there's a text, right? So no Intune of the world, unless you really want to block that, that guy's internet access, policy control has no impact on the phishing protection. I mean, you're gonna click on a link within Dropbox, your Intune is not gonna stop you from accessing a Dropbox link, right? So again, when it comes to phishing, you you have a big problem that is hidden within your legitimate communication that you can't afford to block. Otherwise that user device is completely useless. You can stop that guy from installing a software. That's fine, right? 
but you can't really stop that guy from browsing. And this is where the attacks are coming. So all your policy control, your EMM of the world, they are not of use for phishing attacks because it's within very, very legitimate activity that user is doing. Perfect. Uh, so before I get here, I'll also let everyone know that uh, Lisa, Lisa um, for who's uh, runs our marketing side is also on the, uh, the webinar and I know she's been collecting some uh, questions. So we'll ask her uh, to for some of those questions a little bit later. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to just send them in and, and we'll try to, to attack each one of those and go through them. Obviously it's meant to be highly interactive and, and really beneficial for you from an informational perspective. And last thing we are going to do is just give a, a commercial uh, to what we do. Um, other than to say, just to come back here for a moment, um, really, I, I think when you're looking at how do I solve for, again, what we call human hacking and social engineering and phishing attacks, um, firm believer, when you factor in BYOD, that things have to be done at the endpoint. In, in many respects, so I, I came out of the proxy world. We used to try to solve everything through a proxy, and we used to do SSL uh, termination and break everything man in the middle and then re-encrypt and send it on back down. Um, because I am now using a BYOD advice, I, I have got my personal communication channels and my business communication channels. That's really not effective. Uh, the TLS 1.3 has taken this up one step further where I have end-to-end -end encryption all the way down to that particular endpoint. And unless I'm actually in clear text, I'm not gonna be able to detect and block these things. Um, and I will tell you, these bad actors have become one, they, they've taken it one step further. They're also starting to put HTML, uh, basically um, attachments, and they can put those anywhere, right? Anywhere I can, quote, send a link to you or send some type of email or some type of SMS or some message. Again, it could be in LinkedIn or Twitter. I could have an HTML page and those HTML pages no longer resolve externally. Um, they resolve locally right, to, to your local machine. Guess why? Because they wanna infect that machine. They wanna put ransomware on it. They wanna steal data. Uh, the only way that, that we know how, um, and probably can challenge others out there to, to look at this, the only way we know how to actually prevent and stop those is actually have on-device detection. So meaning machine learning is running local to that, uh, to, to that machine. The key when you're doing that is not only how you have the capability to detect and block those type of attacks, and those are, again, they're extremely targeted spear phishing attacks. Be careful of those things because those are those are rising significantly. The key challenge here, not only how do you have the capability to detect and block those, but coming back full circle, can you guarantee privacy? Uh, again, the only way we know how you guarantee privacy is to do things local to that particular machine and never transmit back to corporate or any other quote big brother that uh, really views the uh, the full browsing behavior the full effectively what do i do in my day and life behavior um going in and out of my personal and business life last thing i want someone to do is to see that and again we know how there's one way to to guarantee that privacy and that's to basically never transmit personal data personal browsing behavior back to corporate and only reflect if there's a particular attack that got tripped on. And at that time is the only thing that's ever shared. And there's some other techniques you wanna do. Uh, but I think the, the important piece here is one, protect on device for BYOD. And second, um, guarantee privacy there because that's how you earn the, the user trust. Um, and, and I would say that's perhaps the biggest pushback we see in a BYOD environment in, in some respects why people still use a separate machine because they simply don't trust uh, the corporation or, or the business. 